I had the pleasure of talking to Concordance and Theoretical uh, last night, and um, we had a very lengthy and interesting conversation. I'm going to ask Scott to pick up um, on one of the points we were talking about, uh, which was objective morality. And perhaps, Scott, you could explain what your understanding of objective morality is when it's used by Sam Harris uh, and compare that to what, it, uh, what William Lane Craig means by objective morality when he uses that term. Scott. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it always baffles my mind when anybody even tries to engage in a conversation about morality, objective or subjective, before uh, each party defining what exactly it is they mean when they say words like moral and immoral. I mean, when I say that, you know, uh, rape is immoral, what is it exactly that I am describing about rape that makes it immoral? I mean, you know, what, what are the qualities and characteristics of something that would make it immoral as opposed to moral? And, and uh, a lot of people kind of just skip this question. Um, and so I think uh, when Sam Harris talks about objective morality, he's, uh, I, I think he would, he would generally, kind of like me, say that what is moral is that which promotes well-being, um, social and societal well-being, as opposed to uh, and as well as personal well-being. Um, whereas uh, uh, William Lane Craig might mean something completely different. I mean, William Lane Craig, uh, admittedly, he says that something is moral uh, means that it reflects God's nature, uh, and so you know God could kill a baby. But that would be perfectly moral because that is God acting in accordance with his own nature. So it is tautological, it is circular when, when Craig um, calls something moral or immoral. Um, Harris, I, I, I don't think, um, if, if there is circularity there, I think it, it takes a lot more investigation to get to it. Um, but uh, yeah, once you, once you know what you mean by these words, I mean, once you say, okay, I know that that when I say that something is immoral, all I'm saying about it is that it causes unnecessary suffering. Well, now we can objectively uh, look at things in the world and say, okay, well, this, this objectively does cause unnecessary suffering. And you can do that by looking at a brain. I mean, you can, you can make objective statements uh, that are objectively true about subjective experiences. It's objectively true that I am subjectively experiencing this. Uh, and so I think that's that's how Harris carries morality from the the philosophical arena to the scientific arena. And make no mistake, science is a philosophy. Um, just picking up on a slightly slightly um, different issue, but it's still relating to objective morality. Clearly, Craig thinks that it's somehow woven into the fabric of the universe. One of the points that Michael and I were talking about on the last show was whether even the concept of objective morality has any meaning um, if there are no sentient beings around to consider it. What are your views on that? Um, yeah, well, I think, I think we're, you know, this is something I was saying last night, is that you have to distinguish between two different claims that, that could be being made here. Um, one is that, in, you know, take a universe comprised entirely of rocks, no, a, a universe without any kind of consciousness whatsoever. There's two questions we can ask about a universe like this uh, in the absence of consciousness. One question is, um, can we in this universe make statements, meaningful statements about morality in that universe that would be true if there were consciousness? I mean, okay, so this universe has nothing but rocks, but is it still true about this universe of nothing that uh, of nothing but rocks that if there were sentient beings it would be wrong to cause them unnecessary suffering sure yes we can make that statement now there's an entirely different claim uh, which is can immorality or morality occur uh, can it take place can it apply in in a universe comprised of nothing but rocks well no that uh, i don't think it makes sense to talk about morality happening or immorality happening in the absence of of um, subjective conscious experience. Michael. Uh, no, that's that's about where I would stand too, that even if suffering doesn't exist in the world or well-being doesn't exist in the world, it still can be true of well-being that it is good or true of suffering that it is bad, even if it doesn't exist. Um, so uh, Scott, I think, nicely cut those two questions apart, and it's good to make that distinction. 
You know, Michael, we, we had an, an interesting distinction we made uh, on our, our last little call between uh, objective implying not contingent upon a mind, and that's a word I don't use very often, versus not, what is it, deriving from a mind? Scott, what was the, what was the specific dichotomy we identified? Right. Uh, yeah, the, I, I, it's, uh, I can get confused about that too until I, I make it not about, use subjective and that makes it much clearer. Like you get, su subjective can mean, mean two different things. Subjective can mean about, you know, or re referring to some, some subjective experience. Um, but then we also kind of use the word subjective to mean um, true, but uh, true in a way that is contingent on somebody's subjective consciousness. So, um, you know, pink is pretty is subjectively true. Um, Scott thinks pink is pretty is an objectively true statement about a subjective experience. So you could even refer to yourself, you know, I think that X. And I, I, Michael and I went back and forth a bit on whether or not he was sort of smuggling in a mind in order to respond to this universe of rocks having a morality because he got to choose that, you know, in that universe, even though there were no minds in that universe, he can say that immorality is, I'm sorry, that uh, suffering is immoral in that universe without a mind. So in that case, it would be contingent upon Michael's mind imposing it on a place where there is no mind. Is that, is that a fair statement? Michael, do you want to, oh, oh is, that, is that for me? Well, we need a third-party arbiter, because <laughs> I don't think we, we didn't arrive at a satisfactory agreement on it, I don't think. I, I think what's happening is that, um, like, what Concordance's point is that when I'm saying that suffering is bad, I'm still making some sort of judgment call. Um, and so that judgment is necessarily dependent on a mind making a judgment. Someone um, to answer the true or false about <clears throat> yeah, the exactly. universe. Yeah, exactly. The relationship may exist. I mean, the, 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 the fundamental underlying thing that we're describing exists, but that's the object. And I think that you are the subject when you're interpreting something in that universe. So that, that necessarily makes it a, a, a subjectivity factor. Well, yeah, and I think, uh, I think I understand the point pretty well. And my response is more that... If we go down that line of saying that, that making any sort of judgment or measurement even of uh, an objective feature makes it um, in a way subjective or adds subjectivity to it, then we really lose the, the meaningfulness in discussing objectivity and subjectivity in the first place. Um, so like I think that one philosopher I really enjoy on who speaks about the, just the topic of objectivity and subjectivity is Donald Davidson, who actually just introduced the term intersubjective, which is actually what I prefer to talk about, which is, uh, and I think it's also really what Harris is discussing when he means, uh, when he talks about things like well-being or suffering or that sort of thing. It's that we all have sort of a standard agreement between each other, um, <clears throat> A standard agreement between each other on the fact that uh, suffering is bad or that well-being is good. It's maybe not uh, objective in the same way that mass is an objective feature of an object or um, like object or other mathematical truths, but it's pretty close. It's it's closer to being like a mathematical truth that we have standardized rules and standardized ideas of what, uh, and a certain level of agreement on what something like suffering is. And I gave the example last time that if you can imagine that someone um, suffering uh, or desiring suffering, like true suffering, not some sadomasochistic experience, but actual just pointless horrible suffering, then I think it's not that you've contradicted me, it's that you've actually changed what we mean by suffering. Like, I think it's part of the idea of suffering, and if you're using that word in a different way, then we're just speaking a different language. Um, that's really what I, I think is going on.
Um, I can unpack that a bit, but I think that's maybe that's a good point for us to be arbitrating between our ideas. Yeah, I want to know what's the obsession with unpacking that you philosophers have. What? <laughs> why that well, term? Sort of, Expand like, upon unquote, unpacking. Expand uh, <laughs> quote unquote. unpacking. Uh, well, yeah, I guess I just picked it up from talking to philosophy nerds. But I've just I've noticed that that's it's I guess a, a trade term. Uh, give me a moment to unpack my argument. I, I don't hear yeah. people say that. <laughs> well, I think it's uh, yeah, it's kind of maybe it's kind of cliche at this point, but it's uh, I think the main idea is that in philosophy, as we just saw with with Scott's uh, opening uh, statements, that you know, it, if you can explain things well and make a good distinction really early on, it helps us all come to some sort of understanding. Uh, and that's actually a really, a really, really valuable skill that I really appreciate with Scott. He's able to do a lot of very, very good unpacking. Unpacking. Unpa I'm a good unpacker. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I hear the reverse. In fact, Scott was telling us about something in a hotel. The two of you guys spent a couple of nights together. Um, you're free to expand upon that if you like. We we did well. Let's un let's unpack that, Michael. Yeah, let's um, unpack we, that. We uh, yeah we we spent a few nights together in D.C. It was romantic. It was intimate. Uh, we we discussed virtue ethics versus utilitarianism with James sort of James Iman, uh, uh, Dallas American atheist, sort of moderating. <laughs> And uh, Jasper Abbey as well was there. Um, well, no, he, no, he we can't really forget. Remember, we had just dropped him off. <laughs> oh, and yeah. He there that final night, and we were and we oh. were going. It's, it's probably a good thing he's not here, huh? Because he's probably, we're probably getting further in this conversation. Yeah, it was actually pretty amazing. As soon as he left, it was like uh, anyway. But yeah, it was it, that was an interesting experience. I think uh, I wish we could have. Uh, could have followed up on that a bit more because there. This is what I do find interesting about philosophical problems. I'm sure Scott agrees uh, that you really can tackle them for a long time, and uh, really, it's it's an it's a very engaging um, and accessible sort of field. I, I, I want to switch topics with your permission. I, I uh, wanted to get on to the William Lane Craig. Uh, was recently watching the Kalam, your, your three Kalam videos. Um, you know, I, I think it's one of the more elegant or more accessible, maybe, uh, videos on philosophy I've watched. Is the 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 simple argument that you know Kalam presumes that. You, you have a creation ex, a creatio ex nihilo, which again is not a phrase I use very often. Um, and you propose that out to William Lane Craig. I've I've looked at the the Facebook posts where he, you know, completely gets the the syllogistic form wrong. It takes it completely out of context. Uh, can you talk about that for a second? Give us give us the short narrative. Yeah, I mean, it really, the, my, my strongest objection, I mean, there, there are lots of objections that you can make to the Kalam argument. I mean, one is that it, it bastardizes and misrepresents science. Another is that the conclusion that God exists doesn't really follow from the actual argument itself, which basically says the universe, you don't get a conscious, thinking, feeling, moral, you know, God from that. But my, what, one problem that I have with, with Kalam is that um, you know, it's it's positing. You know, anything anything that that comes into existence, as far as we've ever observed, is a, a recompilation, a redistribution of of previously existing stuff. And and what is posited by Kalam is that there was there is literally something being caused to exist out of nothing. So so um, my question and and the argument sort of I, I unpack the argument from this. Um, so to speak, but my, my question was how does how does something that exists cause something that doesn't exist to do anything, let alone start existing? Uh, and 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 I think you end up getting into logical incoherence at, at some point because you you don't have God acting upon material and reformulating that you know you know like a like a carpenter causes a table to exist by acting upon wood and nails. Um, God has nothing to act upon. It, there's nothing else there, uh, you know, in order to cause the universe to, to exist. So it's not that God is 
causing something to become the universe. You can't cause nothing to become the universe because then nothing becomes the universe. Uh, and you can't cause the universe to start existing because there's no universe yet. And so you, you're left with no way to really map this idea of God bringing the universe into existence ex nihilo uh, onto reality. There's, there's no way to make that coherent, and that's my biggest objection to the Kalam argument. And he apparently completely misinterpreted that as, as saying, you know, he, took, he took your, I think, syllogistic form of the, his, his uh, argument and you turned it around to be a, a non a proof of the non existence of God, right? Since since clearly that can occur and we presume that to have happened, then the actor that started the whole thing couldn't have existed. That was obviously sort of a you know, tongue in cheek or, or poking a little fun at, at the, the nature of the argument. And he obviously took that as a serious argument that you've disproved God because everything we've ever observed is is about Creatio ex materia, uh, you know, I, obviously not very uh, sympathetically interpreted. Yeah, I think I think Craig has this really bad habit of of intentionally giving his interlocutors um, uh, uh, arguments or objections the the least charitable interpretation possible, uh, and then and then that makes it really easy for him to dismiss them. You'll notice that Craig doesn't doesn't uh, really do cross-examinations, you know, in, in, right. his, in his public debates. He, he also doesn't do um, d uh, written correspondence with people, you know, where it's on record and, they, you know, he said this and then they said that. I mean, he doesn't. So he's very, I think he's very careful about uh, the ways in which he can be um, a, a, approached, you know, in, in terms of right. um, discourse. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of just was having some fun and I basically said, well, you know, nothing that exists can cause something that doesn't exist to begin existing. God is defined as something that did exactly this, uh, so therefore God can't exist. Um, and, and he took that, he, or I, I don't know if he actually really genuinely believed that this is what I meant or if he was just trying to sell his base on this, but, but he publicly took that to, meant, to mean that uh, I am positing non-existent objects that cause things to happen, which is, you know, absurd. But, but the whole point is that, that you can't act on something that doesn't exist yet. I mean, you can't, you can't act on a non-existent object. There's, there's no causal chain where you act on the universe to make it exist, because if it doesn't exist before you start it, it's like having your favorite flavor of ice cream is no flavor, right? Your favorite color is no color. Uh, you, you, you can't, it's, it's, um, it's a definitional problem. You, you obviously can't have that. Um, I think his his you know his big criticism of of anyone who you know purports uh, to say that that the universe began to exist uh, uncaused. You know he goes, well, you're changing the laws of causality. You're you're you're. You know, I mean that that's clearly not how things work. I mean just look at the world and then and then of course then he you know starts re reverting to like empiricism um, and. Uh, um, but he says that, you know, nothing begins to exist uncaused. Well, yeah, but then you can turn that around and you can go, yeah, but anything that does begin to exist is caused in this way, you know, this, this out of material way. Uh, and we've never seen anything begin to exist that wasn't, uh, that wasn't a reformulation of previously existing stuff. And but so, see, he, so he actually says that, you know, what about me? What, what about my existence? I am apparently, you know, he believes that he was created ex nihilo, that, that, somehow William Lane Craig came into existence out of nothing. That's literally what he's asserting in his own post. What a ridiculous position. Well, no, he, it's, it's not that he's saying that. He's just um, glossing over the distinction between um, ex nihilo and ex materia. He, he's saying that he, when I make the point that, okay, look at anything that begins to exist. Look at a table. A table is caused to exist by a carpenter by rearranging wood and nails. Um, you know, every, everything that, so, so he takes that, Craig takes that and says, aha, you see what the atheist is saying? The atheist is saying that nothing ever begins to exist. But the atheist is clearly wrong because I began to exist. There, uh, you know, unless you believe that I, William Lane Craig, was around when the dinosaurs were wool clear that that's false, so I begin to exist, and therefore the atheist is wrong. But he's, he, he's misinterpreting, he, it, 
he's acting like I'm, uh, the, the claim is that nothing ever begins to exist when that's not what the claim is. It's a commentary on the way things begin to exist. And the way everything ever that we've ever observed has begun to exist was as a re formulation of previously existing stuff. And so he is really the one inventing new rules about causality in order to make his conclusion work. Can if I interject at this point? Oh, Michael, uh, do go ahead, Michael, and yeah. then after that I'm going to take the first call. <clears throat> sure. Um, I'd just say that, like Scott, yeah, it's bang on. It, the problem really is uh, with his philosophy of mind. He is making the argument that material was created from non-material things. And we don't know anything about that form of causation. And his backup example is then to say, is another non-material example in his words, which is a person or himself. I think the real issue is that he is, uh, he's basically assumed a form of Cartesian dualism and it's completely undefended anywhere in his literature. Big Lundy, welcome to the show. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, fine. Fantastic. Um, just real quick before I get into this, uh, DPR, I know you were at the charity event last night, the whole Trolling with Logic thing, and we ended up raising uh, about $2,000 for the homeless, so that was, that was actually a pretty big success. Um, I wanted to ask Scott a question. I'm a huge fan of your videos. You could say that I'm a bit of a fanboy, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not wholly uh, unashamed about admitting that. Um, but I, I wanted to ask the question: Would you define yourself as a utilitarianist? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I I keep on. Um Keep in mind, I don't have a philosophical background. I dropped out of high school, you know, and I just sort of picked up all these terms and phrases along the way because it, it seems to work better in conversation with philosophers if you can speak their language. Um, so I, um, I don't know if I'm a utilitarian or not uh, because there are moments where I, all I can do is tell you what I think is true about morality and what I think works uh, for morality. And, and some people have come along and said, uh, well, you're clearly a utilitarian, and the problem with utilitarianism is that it can't solve this problem. And then I go, well, but I would solve that problem this way. And then they go, aha, you're not really a utilitarian, you poser. You know, and I'm, and I'm going, but I never said that I, I, I don't, you know. So um, I, I, I don't, I, some people think I'm a utilitarian, some people think I'm not. Um, I, I don't care, uh, as long as I'm not being misrepresented. And, and as long as I'm afforded the ability to to sort of parse out, hey, parse out, that's that's a better word than unpack, right? Um, <laughs> as a, as a philo philosophical illiterate, perhaps you could explain what a utilitarianist is. Uh, oh, can I do sure. that? Can I do that? Yeah. Um, real quick, uh, and because I, I only do this because I'm a student of philosophy and I plan on teaching it at some point, so i got to start somewhere. Um, a utilitarian is someone who um, looks at morality as sort of a cost-benefit analysis. It's always, what are the consequences of this action? Are they good? Are they bad? Does the good outweigh the bad? Um, that's, that's how a utilitarian um, argues about morality. That's what they're focused on. Uh, it's one of three different normative positions about uh, morality. There's deontology, virtue ethics, and... Uh, um, uh, consequentialism, which includes utilitarianism as one of its core features. Um, deontology, d just because I feel like explaining this, deontology is essentially a sort of respect that you give to pre-established laws. Um, like, uh, if you say I should follow this law because it's the law, then that's deontology. Um, if you're a virtue ethicist, then it's a lot. It's a lot more vague than the other two. It's uh, it's um, it's focused more on the intent behind an action than the consequences of the action itself. Like uh, an abortion can be bad if it's done because the woman uh, wants to have the abortion because they want to go party and they just don't want the responsibility. They don't care about the baby at all. They just have absolutely no feelings about it. Uh, that can be looked at as bad through through a virtue ethicist view, but it can also be looked at as good if the woman. Uh, simply does not have the capability of taking care of the baby and they just want to spare the baby from being put into uh, uh, adoption clinics and all that kind of stuff. And I, I personally would call myself a virtue ethicist. And I think being able to specify which normative position you stem from allows for conversations of morality a lot easier. 
Does does that explain it any well for you? I'm I'm much better informed. Uh, Queen, can you press the call button on for Joshua, and uh, we'll hopefully be joined with uh, by Joshua very soon. Whilst we're doing that, do you want to tell us about your Emmy, Scott? Uh, she's she's a, a cold bitch, um, and and she's sitting on my bookshelf, and she's pointy and sharp, and uh, and do you polish her. <laughs> no, I should actually. I got a question for Scott. I, okay, don't run away, Scott. Okay. Um, I, I loved your "What If I'm Wrong" video. It's still my favorite. Uh, I'm kind of a fanboy too, if you haven't picked that up. But uh, that ties into a theme yeah. with your problem of problem of non-belief, right? The, the 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 characteristics of the Christian God being omnipotent and omni benevolent creates a number of interesting um, conflicts, right? And, and you touched on it really well in the what if I'm wrong, you know, a, a God who knows me, knows what it takes to convince me, and therefore, you know, any failure to do so, it doesn't necessarily have to violate free will, but any any failure to do so means that obviously God can't be omnibenevolent and uh, omnipotent or, or omniscient, uh, one way or the other. Can, can you expand on that with your problem of non-belief? Scott, do you want to deal with that and then we'll come to you? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, the reason I, I think I, I wrote that video um, because I had seen on YouTube, there's a clip of, of Richard Dawkins on a stage and, and somebody from the audience, I think this is after like a lecture he gave or something, somebody from the audience says, genuinely asks him, what if you're wrong? And I hated the way he handled it. I think he was such an asshole about it. Um, he didn't take the question seriously. He didn't give it the intellectual courtesy that he should have. He just sort of dismissed it and said, well, you believe in the juju on the mountain and you're wrong. You know, it, you know and, and I thought that was... So I just wanted to take that question a lot more seriously. And, and the, the idea is, well, if I'm wrong... Um, and there is this God that's that's omniscient. That, you know, you can't have omniscience without having perfect empathy. And and I mean, th this this God understands every single thing about my conscious experience. And it may once you once you start really driving that point home, it gets harder and harder to um, dismiss anybody, any one of us, as just evil, rotten, bad fruit. You know, that that deserves hell. I mean, we all have. We all suffer. We all have, you know, we, we are all products of our experiences. And, and I think an omniscient being is enlightened enough to know that even if his Christian followers are not. So that was what that video was about. I'm sorry, it's like the problem of evil, but, you know, instead of why do, you know, bad things happen to good people, it's the question of why do good people not believe, right? Why, why is there non-belief? Why, why, how would an omniscient omnibenevolent God allow people to die without being convinced, right? Yeah, we really think, wouldn't need faith. Yeah, I think that the, the, the problem of non-belief is, is very, very closely tied to the, the stream of consciousness I, I sort of articulated in, in that What If I'm Wrong video. Uh, I'm going to move on, but just quickly on the Dawkins clip that you referred to, what I, what I saw in that was a tired man at the end of a lengthy uh, lecture tour um, who had been faced with some pretty stupid questions uh, from the audience. It was, it was a Christian college, I think, wasn't it, that he was at at the time. Anyway, let's not dwell on that. Let's welcome Joshua to the show. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Hey. What have you got for us? I'm kind of starstruck, but uh, I wanted to let you guys um, know that although I agree with like everything you're saying and I understand how using logic to prove or disprove the existence of God I mean I try to use it in my YouTube and I try to make sense of it but the problem is that I found is that being seems to be so illogical and that gives it strength that gives it power um, I know that everything that we can pull from the universe is logical like inherently you know but what I think they try to pose that being as is being outside of logic beyond logic so I was wondering how 
you might want to argue against that because, you know, there's verses they take from the Bible that say everything is possible with God. And I've, I've used this kind of argumentation. I was like, does that mean that I could kill God, right? Does that mean it's possible that I could just take all of God's powers away and not even do anything, like just sit here on my ass and, you know, do whatever I want and become om omnipotent, you know? Well, some might say no, and then there's logical contradictions. Well, then that means not all is possible with God, right? And so I was just wondering how you might argue against that. Michael. Um, I think one of the problems that uh, comes up there is understanding that when a religious person has these religious uh, sort of transcend transcendental experiences, yeah, that might be a, a big reason why they believe what they believe. And they might even just be pure existentialists and believe it because it's so crazy and illogical and, and that sort of thing. But I think for most people, they actually do have reasons for what they believe. And they're maybe not things that they think about all the time. Um, I think a lot of it is just habit. And what I think Scott does very well, and I think what uh, a few really good communicators of uh, philosophical ideas do very well, are to break people out of thinking, just running on autopilot and just doing things in the same way and thinking about things in the same way that they always do. Um, it's a real skill to get people to consider what they're thinking or the reasons why they they act the way they do. Um, and yeah, it's hard to break through that, but I, I think it's a mixture of being genuinely interested in the topic yourself, being fairly intelligent, and also being uh, very genuine in your own pursuit of uh, and interest in the topic. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with Michael. Um, Joshua, it sounds like you're kind of um, proposing the whole, you know, get, in the same vein as like you know can god create a rock so heavy he can't lift it you know and and you run into to logical contradictions with uh, omnipotence and things like that i i don't i i think um theists who have have given this this idea a fair amount of thought usually come to the conclusion that god is not uh above or beyond or does not transcend logic um i i don't know a lot i i haven't met a lot of uh christians or other theists who would claim that god can somehow sidestep uh laws of laws of logic however um i do want to say that that um I, I think something a, a sticky problem that a lot of people get stuck on is is treating logic as if it is some outside in governing force rather than um, uh, rules for language uh, because that's really all logic is uh, you know uh, statements like a equals a or a is not not a or um, the law of non-contradiction I mean these are th these are entirely to do with meaning um, and what we mean by a and and it's rules for its prescriptions for using a or X or whatever we're talking about consistently it, it, in our in our discourse, um, logic is just a methodology for deriving proper inferences from statements rather than improper inferences. And there aren't really what makes um, logical laws so absolute is what we mean by these words, not some outside governing force. And so to say that God is beyond logic or transcends logic kind of sounds like saying that God transcends what we mean when we talk about God um, and and how could he uh, when we're the ones having the conversation yeah, this, uh, this really does kind of hark back to the, uh, the the transcendental argument for God which which we we dealt with with Seit and Bruggen Kate and I was admitting to Scott that I cribbed a lot of of my points off of videos he made uh, if you've got a God that is contingent upon the laws of logic then he's not truly omnipotent on the other hand, if the laws of logic are contingent upon God, then they're not really objective. And that was one of Sai's key points, was that the laws of logic are objective, and they can only be objective if God grants them so. Uh, but you know, if, if they're dependent upon God, if God's uh, nature is what determines logical consistency, if God's nature is what determines uh, what is objectively moral, 
then we have a truly subjective set of laws and a truly subjective set of moral law. And they will always be dependent upon or always, always um, subject to revision. You know, if someone can decide, if, and I say someone, if, if some god can decide that A equals A today, but tomorrow I want to uh, have creation from nothing, or I want to make it where slavery is okay here, but it's not okay here, then that's a logically incoherent universe to live in. If miracles can suspend the laws of science and morality and, um, you know, logic, then all of our reasoning is invalid, even our reasoning about God. So this is the counter-apologetic form of that transcendental argument. That is, if the laws of logic and reason and uh, morality, whatever, are dependent upon that mind, and they can be suspended arbitrarily, then we, have, we can't reason about God. We can't use our logic to reason about God. A logically, possibly logically inconsistent God. Josh, so I'm going to come back to you. It actually can be then, turned on itself. Sorry, I'm going to come back to you, Josh, but very quickly, and then I'm going to remove you because I know that uh, Scott does have to leave very shortly, and there's one more call I would like to get in before he leaves us. So, Scott, last, uh, Josh, last point, and uh, then we'll move on to the next caller. All right. I just wanted to say that it was interesting that you pointed out how if um, if logic is contingent about God you know, then you would have no concrete basis for which to understand the universe. I mean, it seems to me, if you wanted to change anything for any arbitrary reason, you'd have no way of perceiving because your mind is set to the If you start including supernatural in your then you'll always have that, you know. Force equals mass times acceleration, except when God wills it to be other than that. Um, and that's that's a logically incoherent system of science. No no relationship can be formally described because it's always arbitrary to the, the miraculous interventions. Um, and that's why, as a as a matter of methodology, we exclude the supernatural from scientific explanation. End of story. So Scott, are you coming back to uh, YouTube? What what's keeping you away? Why why do you have four months between videos? Yeah, well, this this time it wasn't four months. It was like it was almost a year. Um, I I I don't know. I I I have this really um, handicapping mentality where I I keep thinking that if I'm gonna do a video, it has to be really substantial because I, I there's like a point of no return. I mean, I keep I, I started out making very small like just question videos, like one question, like a two minute video, you know, and then it got. It, I, I started to get like more organized, and I started drafting scripts from from my videos, and 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 kind of memorizing what I wanted to say. And I'd have like you know, and my videos got longer and longer and longer. And now I keep on thinking that if I'm going to do another video, it's got to be like this huge presentation. And I know, I know, I don't have to do that. Um, but there's a part of me that only wants to do that now. So, uh, and I understand that that's you know that that is sometimes contrary to what. Um, my subscribers might prefer. I mean, they, you know, I, I'm sure people get fucking sick of 30 minute videos, you know, and, and just want to hear like a little thought, you know, here and there. But um, I'm getting, I, I get restless with that, I guess. So I've noticed that you, your, your delivery is so polished that it's almost as though you have things more or less memorized. And then your eyes will track on the screen for a minute to sort of catch your place. Do you like outline these things, or do you have a script written? What do you? What do you? What's your process? Yeah, I, I start out. I, I start out writing um, the way that I would write if I were doing a, a written correspondence, and then and once I feel like I've got my argument or my presentation, I go back and I look at it and I change some of the phrasing to to be a little more conversational and a little more casual. Although clearly, if you watch my videos, not all of it. I mean, I, I'm, but. Uh, yeah, and then I and then I go through paragraph by paragraph, and I just kind of say it out loud to myself and get myself really familiar with it, so I'm not having to like read it and look at it the whole time. Of course, I do need to like glance back at the screen to remind myself. But um, yeah, I try to. I mean, I, anybody can see that I'm that I'm reading something off my screen, and I'm and I'm obviously not going off the cuff, you know. But but I do. I I think that at least 
giving people that illusion um, helps them to sort of forget about my presentation and just sort of listen to the content of what I'm saying. It, it creates less of a distraction, I think. So I try really, really hard to to fake this sort of you know illusory conversational tone in my videos because I've found that it helps. Yeah, I think your experience as an actor probably really does help your screen presence just because you're used to memorizing lots of lines. You, you know how to, you know, deliver them with inflection and, and rhythm and, you know, a certain amount of, of stylistic talent, um, which yeah. is totally unfair, Scott. You, you've got way too much <laughs> talent for one person. I mean, you've got you to gotta handicap yourself just a little bit for the rest of us. <laughs> well, before he, before he answers that embarrassing question, um, can I just explain that I think the reason we can't get you in, Stefan, is that, uh, yeah, to, to keep it short, Cream is hosting the call unless um, you're on his contact list or you allow people who are not on your contact list to call you, we can't add you. So what I'm going to do instead, because I'm aware of the time and I'm aware of Scott's uh, obligations to be elsewhere soon, I'm just going to read your question out um, and we'll try and do it that way. Hi, he says, I would like to discuss if it is possible to prove or disprove any philosophy with science. How can we find out if a philosophy is, inverted commas, quote unquote, true? Scott. Yeah, sure. Of course we can. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I suppose it depends on wh what the philosophy is. Or what, I mean, not a philosophy, but I think we're talking about like a philosophical claim, right? Um, you can have lots of philosoph you can have philosophical claims about the way that our minds work, which you can use neuroscience to, to disprove. I mean, you can have philosophical claims about the way causality works, which you can use science to disprove. I mean, um, uh, it seems like, it seems pretty obvious that, uh, you know, it's, it, I, I don't agree with, um, there, there seems to be this very trendy dismissal of philosophy as if philosophy can't ever do anything for us. Uh, and I don't think that's true at all. Um, I think philosophy is really 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 important but when it comes to can um, I just can I just press you on that a second because this is uh, a, a sort of criticism that I've I've made um, if philosophy does actually come up with anything productive chances are it's then left the field of philosophy and joined the field of science so what would you say to that and what do you think are the the crowning achievements of philosophy in the last hundred years um, oh god we'll see okay d uh, I'm not Again, I have no education. I can't give you any sort of account of like the history of philosophy and what advancements have been made in philosophy. What I can tell you is that science is a philosophy. I mean, when you're doing science, you're doing philosophy. You're just including empirical data, and that's. I mean, that's really the only difference. I mean, we can, um, we can, we can talk philosophy about you know determinism versus free will, or mind and body dualism, or morality. Uh, but then as soon as we use, we have to use philosophy to pin down what exactly it is we mean by these terms. I mean, this is what, you have to use philosophy to get to Sam Harris's point, for example, which is that morality has to do with conscious experience. I mean, you, you don't get to, you don't arrive at that piece of progress without philosophy. Once you get there, though, science can swoop in and take over and go, okay, well, this, you know, th this would be immoral then and this would be moral. Um, but but you ha philosophy always precedes science. I, I got to tell you, as a scientist, that we don't like that. <laughs> we we don't like that kind of comment being being tossed around. I know it's true, but it it's still annoying, right? Because um, philosophy may have grown. I'm sorry, science may have grown out of of a, a natural philosophy or philosophy of the natural world. Um, but I, I think it's sort of taken on its own rules. Um, it's maybe so specialized. It's such a small uh, sector that, that it, it has its own, its own laws, its own rules. Uh, and I think one of the most important is the scientific method is specifically what's in, used in science. And you don't see the same process going on in philosophy, the, the the actual strategies at getting at something uh, are so divergent that I don't think you really could include them in the same group. Well, sure, sure you do. I mean, in, in philosophy, you do uh, thought experiments all the time. I mean, Al Albert Einstein, in order to do science, 
did thought experiments and and thought experiments are philosophy you're not doing you're not doing science yet you do science when you start testing out your thought experiments but where do you think those come from i mean you, th there there is philosophy built into the very fabric of science there are values built into science there are um you know there's hierarchies of of discord i mean that you you don't now keep in mind when when science and um pure philosophical speculation conflict science does tend to win i mean it, it almost always wins uh and and that's because science can do some things that philosophy can't do uh i don't necessarily and by the way i don't necessarily agree that philosophy can do too many things that that science can't do but but science has to pick up where philosophy left off. I mean, I agree with you. I just, I don't like it. Gotcha. I, yeah. I don't understand why reality won't conform to my, my personal desire. Michael is looming in the background there. I'm sure he's desperate to come up with a few comments. Yeah. I think uh, Scott, it's... just what you do, Michael. Scott, how, long, how much more time do we have with you? I, I know it's now 10 past the hour. Uh, I'll give you, can, can I give you uh, five more minutes? Yep, that's great. Uh, awesome. and can I just tell everyone, once uh, Scott has left us, we're going to be joined by Thunderfoot. So um, if you've got any questions for Thunderfoot, you might want to send a contact request. Uh, he'll be on in about five minutes. Michael. So I think it's, it's an interesting time in science, too, because you see science in the history of science and then the history of philosophy, that when we enter into new fields of science or into... Uh, like closing off old problems. In both those areas, we get a lot of philosophical dis discussion. And actually, I think you can see that with Einstein because he was entering into completely different kinds of questions than uh, people had been asking before. And actually, a lot of his contemporaries, too, were uh, like uh, Schrodinger was very, and Ernst Mach a bit before him as well, they're very philosophically literate. Um, I think we're probably approaching something like that again with string theory, that there's actually a very big uh, disagreement between like two big names would be Lawrence Krauss and Brian Greene about what, what are the limits of science and what is sci science really? Is it a compatibility with the way we can model the world or is it more based on experimentation? And those are two scientists. Um, it, but there's no two, there's no experiment that you could do to reconcile that. There has to be, or at least not yet. Uh, at right at this point, we have to do a bit more probing and probably a bit of unpacking to get, to get ourselves <laughs> past those problems. So it's, uh, I think it's, there's no real reason why uh, we should have, like I think a lot of us in the free thought or atheist community feel that there's a bit of tension there, but that's mainly because of these stupid apologetics arguments that, that happen. Um, I, I actually, and, I, I'm thinking yeah. of the philosophers of science who, who tend to <laughs> treat scientists as some sort of um, test subjects. I, I've had a couple of exchanges with people who are very knowledgeable in the philosophy of science, and I always come away feeling like they consider the science. I, you know what? I think both sides probably think the other is sort of looking down on them. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Like, there should be no real uh, tension there any more than there is right. between, like, chemistry and history. It's like, which one wins when they fight? It's like, it's a, they're different fields. They're different problems. Well, I think we're joined by Thunder, who wanted to comment on this point, which is why I brought him in a few minutes early. Thunder, are you with us? Yeah, hi. Um, just fiddling, trying to get the video to work. Um, my point on this Don't worry be... about the video. In fact, I'd invite you to turn your video, your camera off to save on broadband. Um, just keep the okay, audio quality. Okay, it's done. Even Thank better. Thank you. Um, the, um, all of these things are essentially an endeavor that we care about what happens in the future. So everything is essentially about making models of reality that will tell you what happens in the future. Now, philosophy may be the broadest structure, but the only one of those that actually... Um, works out in practice turns out to be scientific naturalism. Now, you know, it's an interesting question. If it didn't work, would we ditch it? Well, yes, probably, but 
um, in terms of actually getting models of uh, predictive utility about the future, um, it's it's a race with only one horse in. I mean, there is just nothing else that um, is in practice as useful as um, scientific naturalism. Are you saying, Thunder, that philosophy is useless, in short? Um, the only one that has actually um, yields any practical utility is scientific naturalism. I think yeah, you are saying what I'm suggesting you're saying, but you're being too polite in front of two philosophers. No, I, you know what, I think ethics are really vital. Uh, ethics and um, in physics, I mean, they, they really do blur the line. Uh, answering metaphysical questions requires yeah. a little integration of both. But, but this is this is essentially an argument from paucity of data because you don't fully understand the system, you know, of of morality. Um, it, it's um, not a bottom up argument. Um, but if you did actually fully understand um, the way that the system worked, um, then you can actually define what morality is and maximize accordingly. On that note, I, I know that we've taken up that. your five minutes, Scott, so I'm going to leave you so, with the last word. Let, let, okay. Well, Thunder, no, um, he, he's, he's extended by 15 minutes uh, the time he uh, offered us, so it's over to Scott for his last words, and then we'll come back to you, Thunder. Um, yeah, well, yeah, in order to get to the place that you're talking about, Thunderfoot, you, you need to, to do philosophy. I mean, it, it takes... You know, when we talk about words like moral and immoral, we have to have a conversation about what exactly it is that we mean by that. And we have to come up with, because nobody else is going to do this, uh, a definition for what we mean by moral and immoral. And one of the, the challenges of, of creating or finding a definition like that is that you don't want to ex, you know, make the definition so rigorous that you're excluding things that should be intuitively uh, included and you don't want to include things that really should be excluded and so this is a challenge but once you and 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 you can't start doing science on the subject of morality un, until you have that definition but to get that definition you have to do philosophy now philosophy will never get you an iPad uh, and and it won't um, solve global warming but philosophy um, is the boost that science needs in order to make those things start happening Thunder, I will come back to you, but for now, Scott, thank you very much. I imagine that phone call was you being chased up. Uh, can I ask, uh, invite everyone in the room to please give a big thumbs up for uh, Scott, theoretical bullshit, um, and we will certainly take up uh, your offer to come back and see us in the future, Scott. Thank you very thank much you indeed so much. for your time. I'm honored you had me. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, Thunder, I'm sure you wanted to respond. Can I just remind people, uh, we are having some technical issues getting people into the call, uh, which is why I've been somewhat tardy in responding to a lot of you. We are uh, doing our best, um, but uh, obviously Scott has gone, so I'm going to be concentrating on questions now for Thunder and the other two panellists. Um, I don't have anyone lined up, so please carry on this conversation. I think it's quite interesting as I line up our next caller. Thunder, back to you. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think when you're reducing things to, um, you know, how people feel, um, if you actually understood what made people feel that way, then it, it, it becomes, it, it's not really about um, what people feel, it, it's about what makes them have those feelings. So, um, things like art, um, people will say that you can't, uh, quantify art. I would actually disagree with this um, in that uh, when I look at art it is essentially um, an exercise in playing with people's pareidolia. Yeah, it's the ability to see things when they're not actually there. Um, and once you actually understand um, the, the, the algorithm y you can um, essentially just write down the equation for making art. Um, and I don't see particularly why you can't have a similar sort of thing um, for um, morality. Now, uh, you, you, when you get people who sit down in front of an art gallery, that, yeah, that doesn't take anything away from their feelings, but it does describe why they have those feelings. 
And it also allows you to, yeah, it, it gives you the predictive capability. It gives you the ability to essentially make art at the push of a button. I'm not, I'm not really sure, Thunder, that that, I mean, I just have to make a funny comment. How many Rodans equal one uh, uh, Michelangelo? Is it like three thinkers? Oh, anyway, I, 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 I don't think that that's really a conflict with philosophy. I, I don't think that the conflict that you're seeing is really the result of science versus philosophy. Uh, it's well, probably you, more... You, you, would, you would probably agree with me that um, philosophy, um, I'll use the words tends to hide, um, for want of a better term, in um, things uh, in a parameter space that is difficult to define. So, so it, it, it tends to mostly exist in things like morality and art. Um, uh, well, no, I wouldn't agree with that. I, there's, there's all sorts of other things. It's different modes of thinking, and it's thinking about thinking, right? It's, it's, exactly, uh, right. So it, it's, um, it, it hides away in the parameter spaces that are hard to define. I know Michael is... And because you can't adequately... Sorry, after Thunder, then Michael. I think Michael, is he frozen? No, Michael, are you I, there? I'm, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. You're a philosopher, okay, though. You probably, don't, you probably don't have an opinion. Well, this is... Uh, actually, I've always find it interesting. Like, my background is in neuroscience. I have almost no formal training in philosophy. Right. Um, so, I, I often... I don't know. Just want to mention that, uh, like, and in this case, um, I don't know. It's it, to say that it, philosophy is hiding in a way in the areas that are hard to define. It's. I don't think that's really fair because that's what they're trying to do. That's the, that's the the topic matter. Mm -hmm. it, that there's a discussion about. Um, what makes something beautiful? That's like I don't find that area of philosophy interesting at all, and know almost nothing about it. But like art appreciation and aesthetics is something that is a topic matter that um, particularly artists like to take up. Um, and the same thing is true of like things of like, philosophy of mathematics, which mathematics you could not possibly get more rigid and defined as that. But there's a lot of discussions around um, right up until now. Like there's papers that were written this year that fundamentally change what we think about mathematics at its most primary level. So it's not that they're hiding away in these these vacuous, confusing areas, um, and it's all just sort of a scheme to to get tenure and to uh, perpetuate philosophy programs. It's that no need to sound defensive now. <laughs> well, I'm. Well, I'm, I mean, then, uh, okay, but it's, but I think there really is uh, that feeling out there that, um, and you're articulating it, that um, they're just sort of only going into the areas that are, are really um, sort of easy to do, and I, I don't think that's true, and I also think it's, uh, you're kind of making a false comparison because, um, yeah, in, in certain areas of science, I would say, I'd really emphasize that it's only certain areas of science. You get very well-defined problems. Um, but that's also true of philosophy, where you do have very well-defined problems or contradictions or um, uh, areas where two different ideas really come into to contract, like paradoxes. Um, and you also have one's areas that are complete speculation. So... Again, I don't think any of these are un the problems you're outlining are unique to philosophy. And again, I don't really think science or engineering would be much better off. But as Scott said, yeah, it's not going to get you an iPad, but that's not what it's supposed to do. It's not supposed mm -hmm. to build rocket ships or build iPads. Or so, do what does it do? Yeah, well, I think I think Michael, that that is what a lot of people distrust is that. No one ever comes up with an answer. <laughs> you know, there's no, there's no outcomes that are tangible. There's no yeah. philosophical progress. It, it, it's not a convergent. It's often not a convergent uh, kind of field. It, it doesn't. You don't see, uh, you know, progressive building upon. You don't see a convergence on a, a more approximate, more more accurate answer. 
and I'm not expressing my own frustration. My own frustration is just the philosophers themselves sometimes are, are very yeah. difficult well, to deal with. I, but. I think, yeah, just to jump in there too, I think mm -hmm. like why I really like Scott and I think why he is so, so popular is because of he is, well, he's very brilliant at, at taking on these problems. But one of the things that philosophers um, and a lot of scientists also are really bad at doing is just communicating their ideas. Um, and being charitable with other people and expressing some sort of genuineness with with the actual uh, um, task itself. So I, I guess back to the the idea that um, yeah, there's there's nothing I get out. There's no uh, uh, there's no iPad I get out, out of the end of this. There's no laptop. There's no walking on the moon or, or anything like that. Right. But I think but it's a is, real. There, 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 there is there is a philosophy that does that. It's scientific naturalism. It does get you iPads. It does get you to the moon. It, 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 it does build your modern civilized society. Whereas mm, these I other philosophies... Uh, especially when you that. frame it like that. I think that's, that's really a mistake. Um, because one of the most fundamental things about a, a society would be its laws. And there's no area that I think philosophy is more relevant than uh, than the field of law. Again, oh it's, it's hiding. Wow. Hiding away. <laughs> I mean, How? this is again, it, it's hiding away in the parameter spaces that are hard to define, which is basically morality and art. Now you're like trying to law? piss off DPR, Michael. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I this said is this. A, this is the second time you've been on and telling me, a philosoph philosophical illiterate, that my. My profession is all down to philosophy. I, I'm going to insist that uh, you call them over the time. Well, no, stop, stop. We're going to move on. Um, first caller, and it's going to be a complete change of uh, topic. Uh, Observer, are you with us? Yes, Sam. Um, can you hear me? I can help you, sir. Uh, following the uh, busy miles versus uh, Thunderfoot debate, I wanted to talk about um, the limitations and the the kind of red lines of um, free speech. When, you know, when when do you stop someone from talking and put them in jail, for example, uh, because of free speech, because they said something uh, which is not right. Is there even, I mean, do you think there should be this kind of uh, limitations, or red lines? Just what do you think about that? Okay, we'll go to Thunder. Limitations on free speech. Your right to swing your fist starts at the, stops at the end of my nose. I mean that that's that's the um, uh, how shall I say the widest tent um, that I think can and should be established. That's basically um, you are allowed free speech up to the point where you're actually inciting criminal activity. And in fact, e even the American Constitution is sort of born out of this um, fantasy that. Um, you, it, it's it's not only it, it's your duty to rise up and destroy the government if it gets corrupt. So I mean, even then, you might say that's not an absolute limitation. But I think the it, it's most best and most simply summed up as you can say essentially whatever you want, as uh, as long as it's. Um, not uh, it, it gets a little fuzzy when you're inciting crime, and a lot fuzzier when you're inciting violent crime. What about hurting feelings? Nope, you have uh, absolutely not. There is um, no prerequisite to to tread softly. Concordance. If you know, DPR, you probably can speak to this a lot better than I can, but I was doing a little reading on the case law around free speech on private property. And it's it's not a settled issue. Um, you know, Free Thought Blogs is a private blog. Someone owns it. It's their private property, and they can decide who has access to it and who doesn't. It obviously has a chilling effect when there are certain topics which must be made off limits where we, we have and I think it's an important distinction between content editing meaning these things are okay to say these things are not and stylistic or 
um, what would the other term be? You, you know, controlling how things are said, controlling, you know, cutting a few sentences here or there without changing the meaning. If, if people are free to speak their minds, even if what they have to say is objectionable to a percentage of the rest of the, the, the group, then I think that fosters a, a, a ferment of ideas. Uh, even if it's just a, a matter of holding someone up and saying, this person is so obviously ignorant, look how dumb his arguments are, that still has value. I mean, uh, there's no reason why we should ban the Ku Klux Klan from, from marching down our main street as much as it makes our skin crawl, because that's really what it's about. It, it's about no one being forbidden to say something. At the same time, the limits we put on free speech do need to include making people feel unwelcome. So you know we, we can we can go so far down that road that if people are afraid to speak because of speech that's being done, that creates another paradox or conflict. Um, how do we foster a free exchange of ideas where one person's ideas are suppressing someone else's? I, it's so complex. It's so difficult to find a clear path through it that. You know, we kind of have to blunder our way through every time. Yeah, it it is a, a difficult problem. I think the um, it's I don't really know a lot of the backstory on this. Well, I, I kept up with it, and I I run a uh, educational nonprofit, and so we do do conferences, and we we are investigating having a harassment policy and I think it's a good thing so I had to keep up with this um, but I think in most harassment policies that exist and I've looked at a number of them I was also involved with like parliamentary legislation on anti-bullying laws that are are now instituted in Canada um, that a lot has to depend on exactly how things are worded and even when you get the best policy Possible that everyone can agree on. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot more focus that has to be put into exactly how it's implemented, um, and I don't think any policy is is ever going to address all of these concerns. But we can start to move in the right direction, um, and I think like what Concordance is saying makes a lot of sense. That um, it if you if there are certain types of speech or certain types of behavior that fundamentally just make people feel unwelcome. And if I'm putting on a conference or my organization is putting on a conference, um, like it should be there for everyone to enjoy it and participate in the ideas, especially when it's an educational um, atmosphere. You want the, everyone to, to come to, to be educated, to, uh, to have their say and to, to be involved. Thunder. Yeah, I mean, I, for my part, I think that uh, with a lot of these people who you vigorously disagree with, I mean, people like uh, Westboro Baptist Church, um, sunlight is the best sterilant. I have no problem whatsoever with those people being able to say what they want. Um, in other words, the speech often speaks for itself, and in this way... Um, I was actually really very disappointed by the actions of Free Thought Blogs because to actually allow people to say dissenting things, um, it, it shows that um, you have an appreciation for the forum. Um, the, the, the idea that people should be allowed to not be afraid to put their ideas forward. Yeah, this is very much what is adopted in academia. Um, and it, to actually allow a dissenting voice on I mean, it, it was their forum, I have to say this. And yeah, there was no contract or anything like that. They didn't want me on there. They were entirely within their rights just to say, you know, you're not having access to our website anymore. Like they're entirely within their rights there. Um, but what does it actually say about them as an organization when... Um, 
this is how dissenting voices are treated. Um, it, if if it were me, even if I didn't agree, even if I vigorously didn't agree uh-huh. with the point of view being put forward, I would have let them stay. But um, okay, I'll, I'll I'll cut it at that. So I, I if you if you let me respond to that, I. I have been trying my best to understand everyone's perspective as best I can. And, and I know that the people who run free thought blogs are very concerned about creating a safe environment, just like Michael's very worried about creating a safe environment where everyone feels included. I think ultimately they felt that... Well, concordance, a, there's a huge difference between safety and included. Safe, when you refer to sorry, safety, you're it's right. almost like they'll be in danger you're if right. they carry on that. And that, that, was, that was actually, yeah, that was a very telling mistake I just made. Because um, those are two very different things. You're right not to be offended, and you're not right not to be threatened. But I, I think for some people, there is a lot of overlap. It's like the uh, very contentious issue of trigger words. You know, references to rape, to a rape victim, uh, can be very traumatic. And, you know, it's an unexpected thing for them to blunder into. Uh, I live in this nice sheltered little world where these are not the kinds of things I usually have to think about. But when you get out there and you've got a, a larger community to think about, I, again, just trying to understand what their thinking was, I think that they thought <laughs> that they were creating a more, they were fostering a more inclusive society or a, a more, um, they thought they were increasing the diversity of the group by actually dropping thunder. And I, I think that there's a delicate balance there. I, I don't think censorship, and I call it censorship, they obviously would, would dispute that. I don't think that silencing someone or excluding them can ever ultimately increase the inclusiveness. I, I think they, they went left in order to go further right. I, I don't think that's ever going to quite work. I'm rambling a little bit. Go, go, Thunder. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to put a little point of irony in there, is that um, you may remember that some time ago, PZ actually got expelled from the movie Expelled, which was, um, ironically, about academic freedom. And there was this big sort of thing, you know, can you believe the irony here about actually getting expelled from a movie about academics getting expelled, which is almost verbatim what he did here. It was for um, me, me expressing my views, I got banned from free thought blogs. I mean, uh, there, there is, um, how shall I say, a level of irony here that is difficult to not find amusing. I think we've moved slightly off uh, the topic that Observer asked about. He was talking about things more generally, and one of the things that immediately sprang to my mind when he talked about whether people should be locked up was the case of someone in, oh God damn it, my mind's gone. He got two Indonesia? and a half years. Indonesia, Indonesia maybe? Two and a half years, yes. Alexander uh, on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what are people's, I, I think we're probably going to be uh, universal in our uh, observations on this one, but what are your comments on that? Is, is that the, more the topic that you were addressing, Observer? Yeah, that, that's more the... Okay, yeah. well let, let's, let's go around the panel, uh, starting with Michael. Okay, well, actually, I, I've, um, again, with my work, I've been very heavily involved with this case, and I've, even to the point of soliciting help from uh, the Canadian federal government uh, with the foreign ministry. Um, it, I think what really has to happen uh, is there, we, we all have to recognize that this is a, a very serious problem. The only thing that Alexander did was to post on on Facebook his religious beliefs, and he's been thrown in jail for it. Um, there's actually a few other cases. There's one in, in Maldives um, or Maldives. Um, there's another one in India of a skeptic being being thrown in jail, and it actually. Well, they Michael, all can I just address you on? The, can I just address sure. you on that? Uh, I, I don't like interrupting people, and I get criticised for it, but I think this is very um, uh, useful. Um, the person you're referring to uh, in India, I think, is the one who um, debunked the idea that miracle water was flowing from the feet of uh, the statue of Jesus. 
That's exactly right, yes. Yes, and he, he he's not actually being thrown in jail and he hasn't yet been uh, prosecuted, but he is potentially going to face a prosecution uh, encouraged by the Catholic Church for blasphemy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been in contact with him myself. Uh, he has agreed to appear on the show, and our next show in two weeks' time will um, feature YouTube user Non Stamp Collector. The program after that, uh, so four weeks uh, from today, we will actually have him on the show if he's not being locked up. So do go on. Yeah, well, I think that's exactly, you are actually doing the, the thing that everyone should be doing in this community, which is drawing more attention to these types of problems, because um, I think we, as a movement, have become very inwardly focused and, and spend far too much time on issues like, um, sorry, to PZ and Thunder, but I, I just don't care about your blogging problems compared to someone being thrown in jail for, for their speech. Um, and when that happens over and over again across the world, we need to start waking up and, and realizing that um, our problems with fighting creationists in, in public schools, while important, um, should really take, a, I think, a more proportionate amount of time compared to the people who put put up a Facebook post and then get attacked or have their throat slit um, in these different parts of the world because we can actually make a difference. Well, I would actually say that it's these are opposite ends of the slippery slope and um, whilst yes one is in a more egregious um, uh, bastardization of this than the other um, nonetheless, the the two are connected, in that um, once you accept the um, uh, once you start um, adding more and more things to what is not permitted speech, once you uh, lose your commitment uh, to that. Um, I'm going to call it a dogma in this case because this is almost the only thing I would actually go as far to call. Um, almost dogma. Um, it, it is the first link of the chain that binds us all. Um, and so, yeah, I agree completely. What these people have to put up with in places like Indonesia, where you, uh, this is just the other end of the scale. You know, it starts with you're not allowed to criticize A, you're not allowed to criticize B, and so it goes on until you get to these people in Indonesia where. You, you, for suggesting that the the water coming from the statue's feet isn't the tears of Jesus or something, this is the the other end where uh, the 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 links of the chain have completely bound you. So I mean I I don't um, uh, I think that these are opposite ends of of the scale, but it is the overall picture that you shouldn't actually. Um, uh, accept that there are things that you can put into the list of criticisms you're not allowed to make. Well, Thunder, I mean, in this country, we have a law that prevents people from um, going around making hate speech that does fall short of inciting violence. Um, yeah, no, and, I, and I am so opposed to that. But do you think that there should be there shouldn't be laws preventing people from? Um, standing on a corner of street shouting nigger at uh, any black person that walks past them. No, there well, shouldn't be laws. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there, there, does come a point, um, there does come a point when making noise does sort of become um, assault in that the ears are quite sensitive organs and you go and shout in someone's ear, you can do physical damage. So there does yeah, come I'm a not point when it does. But yeah, no, I mean, if, 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 if that's... Um, uh, if if that's uh, the way that people want to express themselves, then people will judge those people accordingly. Michael, I mean, that's a very just, dangerous yeah, precedent I, I, to I, set. I, I think. Uh, sorry, there's there's a very good uh, I think case case history in Canada on this, um, where someone was tried for human rights violation after he was uh, teaching hol Holocaust denial to his students. Um, in a history class. Um, it wasn't just that he was removed from the, the school system, and I, I do think it is appropriate in that case, when he's teaching nine-year-olds, that 
the Holocaust was a Jewish conspiracy. That that this is, is hate speech. Different. Well, but again, this is uh, forgive me for uh, um, tenting up in in the murky areas of philosophy, but this is exactly where the area where where things get mucky. And no, it's not a murky area of philosophy. Well, this is the when let, let Michael finish. Okay, finish. Okay, but it, it's. I'll just leave that aside, uh, but it's uh, like I do think that's a good example of some uh, of a case where the damage done wasn't just to the listeners. There's actually a societal di damage done when people are allowed to uh, speak in a certain way and effectively just uh, deride an entire group of people, an identifiable group of people. Because I, I also think it's ridiculous. Well, I, I do think you have to be very careful with free, freedom of speech, and it is important that there are at least some cases where the time to intervene is far, far before there's rioting in the streets and and uh, there's essentially just a forced ghettoization of people. Like some groups are more sensitive than others, not just in terms of how they feel, but the actual impact that's done to the group because of this speech. Thunder, then concordance. Yeah, I mean, very briefly, the reason that the children are different is because children are growing minds. Um, and the same, you know, the developmental trajectories are much easier to mess up than um, uh, when, once people have reached maturity, for the same reason that uh, drinking during pregnancy can cause more damage than drinking um, uh, when that child has actually grown into adulthood. Um, but... Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, free speech can lead to um, what I would call metastable situations where you can get um, bad ideas propagating. This is the price that you have to pay. However, this is balanced against the fact that um, in the open marketplace of ideas, good ideas generally propagate better than bad ones. It's not universally true, but generally true. Um, and uh, I, I think that the best way to counter um, essentially disinformation is with information. Uh, that's just my reckoning on that. And the way that you most effectively do that is with the most open forum. Concordance. I mean, I, I can't believe I'm forced in the position of being the the free speech advocate in this group, but. The, the the U.S. First Amendment, right? The, the the freedom of speech is the first one because it's so fundamental to all the other ones. I, I completely understand appropriate venue. You know, it, it's not appropriate to shout fire in a theater because that can result in harm to others. People have a right to be free of harm, but I don't think they have a right to not be offended. And well, that's that. that Wait, wait. Sorry, that's, at that point, when you start, well, what, what I'm what I'm getting at is there really needs to be a distinction between venue, uh, style, uh, uh, editorial. You know, the, the the small changes of where you can think something, what what how you can act on it. But when you begin to abridge whole modes of thought, or if you begin to outlaw specific words then I really do think, and I hate to use the slippery slope because it's abused so heavily, but once you've decided what people can and can't say in whatever context, then you've given an agency thought control, the, the right to control reality. And it, it's so fundamental that I'm, I'm very sensitive to any proposal like for example, you know, even anti-bullying, um, uh, hate speech legislation, uh, and also, I'm sure this one would touch a little bit more of a nerve for you, uh, the anti-blasphemy laws that are in place or are proposed um, for, for global distribution. You know, not being able to blaspheme is the kind of control that I feel pretty passionately should be resisted or opposed. Um, and it all starts with those very small things. You're right to say something. Now, again, I think it's still appropriate to regulate where you can say it. 
You know, you, you, you can't stand up in a schoolroom and, and say to students that X, Y, or Z, if it's something that is potentially harmful. The state has an interest in that. A community has an interest in what a teacher can say in the classroom. But if that teacher goes home, puts on his Nazi uniform, uh, and goes around picketing, as long as it's not in his capacity as a teacher, I think we have to give it more leeway. You know, if it's not interfering with, you know, in his private life, he ought to be able to do whatever stupid or ridiculous thing he wants to do. Let me just give you a hypothetical concordance. Children race in a cult. Does society have a responsibility to um, free them from the indoctrination? Or would you see them, I mean, because the, the, the children I see as an, a, a, an exception to this. When, when people are adults, they basically take responsibility for themselves. However, when they're growing up, um, they are much more sensitive to the environment. And so um, I, I think that society has um, some responsibility to ensure that they get a realistic representation um, in their education of what society is and how um, they interact with it or whatever. So how would you feel about children in cults? Intervene, not intervene? Do, I mean, do you consider this a freedom of speech issue? Um, but I, Thunder, I, I do think that that point that you asked um, concordance was slipping a little bit away from free speech, but I also know that Michael wants to make a point, and I thought we were going to go to him next. Whilst Michael makes a point, I'm going to try and bring in the next caller. Yeah, uh, I have to say that, um, like, yeah, this... You all know that when you said slippery, that these are slippery slope arguments, that slippery slope arguments are bad, right? Um, you, no, no, you're I all mean, aware it's just, it, it's just that, an that acknowledgement. Me, that's actually, that, it, it's just yeah, an, this an is, acknowledgement that's a left extreme and on a right but, extreme but and a continuum of states When you compare a harassment policy, I have to say, when you compare a harassment policy at a convention with someone being thrown in jail for a fake Facebook post, you're... You're Glenn backing the argument, basically. Like you're, this is the worst type of exaggeration. No, not at all. Yeah, um, it I, is, I, absolutely. I'm, it's it's. I, but the the other thing too is like, come on, the the atmosphere in which you have to live affects you, and there are types of speech that are not used to communicate ideas, but are rather used as a weapon to hurt people. And it's that type of speech that should be targeted. It might be hard to do, but I and it might be hard to make that distinction. But I, I don't think there's a problem, especially when you're talking when we got into the the uh, anti-bullying legislation in schools. What was happening in Ontario schools was that that kids were being called faggot and then dropping out or killing themselves or just living in constant terror. And I, I think it it's okay, it's absolutely your responsibility as an administrator to intervene before it gets to that point, before there is the tip of your nose being broken. Because it's known that certain types of speech are not meant to just be a, an expression of your opinion. I think harassment policies are the same way. Like. I, I've spoken to people who've, who've been at conferences, uh, female speakers who have been to conferences and were approached after their speech and asked how much it would cost to have sex with them. Like that is a form of harassment. That's not expressing your political or religious opinion. That's meant to insult and degrade someone. And I think it's absolute, it's actually beyond permissible, it's the responsibility of the organizer, in that case, and the teacher in the school and the government, in, in the bullying legislation, to protect people from having that happen to them. Right. Now, let me just unpack the only point that I actually got out of that I, I, I think that need, really needs addressing. And that's this idea that because it's better in some places and worse than others, that actually saying that there is a continuum of states between these two is actually the important thing and that actually going to a state where there is less free speech than more is a bad thing. Um, you say that this is Glenn Beck in the argument. That's just bullshit. Now, you know, this is like saying there is high ground and there is low ground, right? You understand there is high ground and low ground and the continuum of states between them, right? Now, 
is it better to move a step up or a step down? Right, there is a continuum of states between them. Right, you're saying that yeah, the the, the one the, the one at the bottom of the hill's worse. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Right, and the one at the top of the hill that's better. But if you're in the middle somewhere, taking a step up is going to a better state, and taking a step down is going to a worse state. If you think that's Glenn Beck in the argument, then we we really do disagree on the terms there. Well, I, I, it's. Well, maybe we could leave it at that point that there's a disagreement. Yeah, I, I think unless, there's a unless disagreement. you wanted to come back, we've got the next caller lined up. Well, it's I, I do think there we should have some. Um, my main objection would be the amount of attention that's gotten through on this free thought blog thing is disproportionate to the amount of harm that's been done. Especially I when agree with that. And on, on that point, let's let's. Uh, move on to um, Crackman, who I hope is with us. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting so long. I did promise I was going to bring you on first, but um, I thought that the other callers' points were more relevant to what was being discussed at the time. So I apologise for that. Um, at least you're here now. How can we help you? No, well, uh, I think my question will change the, sh the subject. Uh, I, I don't think I want to do that. I was really interested. But uh, well, it's too, I can't. It's too late now. The pressure's on you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know, but I, I will try to to change it. Uh, yeah, please do. To Go get, ahead. To to get to this the the same subject. Uh, I was I was going to ask you you guys and uh, about your back background and uh, the things that you um where you learn and and your inspirations, the books where that you. Head, uh, head, and things that made made you uh, do what you do uh, in the internet. But to uh, not change a lot the the subject, and the the subject is uh, free speech. I want to know uh, what what you have read about this the subject that makes you have these thoughts that we are that you you are discussing right now. Um, what motivates us? Um, what's caused us to come onto YouTube? Um, I think that's that's where we're coming from. What 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 motivates us to do it? I think. Thunder. Yes. Why are you coming to me? Concordance. Okay, um, okay, that's better. <laughs> I grew up reading Carl Sagan uh, long before I decided to be a non-theist or, or whatever. I was very interested in skepticism and the idea of getting to the bottom of what's true and what's not true. And that naturally led me towards science. And so the my background is in science. I don't know how many years of school it, it added up to and how much time I've spent doing research. But the whole trajectory trajectory of my life has been about empirical observation and trying to get to the truth of things trying to get to the the underlying you know i, I remember as a kid i took apart a, a clock i think most kids at some point in their life probably do this and you see all those little gears and you want to know which one does what you know how do these things interact with each other and you know, it's very fascinating i think all kids are born with that natural inquisitive scientific mind and some people just sort of let it go they 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 emphasize other aspects of their personality but that was the thing that always appealed to me especially Carl Sagan uh, Isaac Asimov I read a lot of Asimov a lot of science fiction um, and it, it captured my imagination um, so I I see my presence on YouTube as a, as a chance to talk about the things that interest me and one of those things is uh, skepticism and my lack of belief is a is a small consequence of uh, my general approach to understanding the world. Can I make a, a point? Uh, another Please question. Do. Uh, it's about about you just say the con concordance, and you were saying about the the science and the, the things that you learn about science when you were we were a kid, but. Uh, we, we, you were 
we're all of you were talking about uh, free speech. What mm -hmm. uh, and and in and morals too. What do you have read and your inspirations to talk about free speech, morals, and other stuff like stuff like that? Not not just science. Science is. I, I think Carl Sagan to me is is also one one great inspira inspiration. Like Voltaire is mm -hmm. uh, in, an inspiration about free speech and humanism. So uh, I, uh, thank, I think yeah, I think I think we've got the point, and through no discourtesy, I'm going to remove you as the panel address that point. Thank you very much indeed for your call. As I say, it's not through discourtesy. I'm just trying to get through as many callers as we can. Why do we feel so strongly about the issue of free speech? Who would like to take that? Michael? Um, sure. Um, <clears throat> one person, I'm probably going to get a lot of flack for this, that, uh, that I really admire on this topic was actually Noam Chomsky. Um, I had a, a very big fascination with a lot of his work. Yeah, Concordance is going to say. Not a fan. Uh, smirking. Yeah, not going to be a fan. But um, actually, he is—he uh, had probably the most consistent, um, and I'd say one of the best views on free speech. Um, in the mid '80s, um, there was a, a a French author who had published a book that would, which was a Holocaust denial book, um, and Chomsky had actually been part of creating a part of a, a group of academics who thought that his imprisonment, his subsequent imprisonment, was, um, was unjustified. And when asked about this, he said that freedom of speech only matters for the opinions that you hate. Everyone believes in freedom of speech for the opinions you agree with. It's actually for the ideas that are most horrifying to you that that's when freedom of speech matters. Um, and I've tried to, um, I, that's where my interest came of it, because I thought that was very consistent. That's right, that it's it, possible to be a, com, a complete totalitarian and uh, accept the speech that you agree with. It's only when it comes in the difficult cases, when it's hard to accept the other person's point of view, that your belief in freedom of speech is actually put to a test. Um, and I even carried that out. I once debated a, uh, a very hostile anti-abortion anti group um, in Canada, uh, and they were banned from the, um, from the university that we were going to debate in. This was like four years ago. And I actually stuck up for and spoke to the media about why it's important to have these sorts of debates, even when many people thought it was hate speech, to, it was hateful to argue against women's rights. But at the time I said, no, that's, that's actually the test of whether you actually believe in freedom of speech. Um, especially when it was taking place in the context of a debate and where both sides could be aired and viewed. That's really, I think, the best sort of example, um, academic material is similar in that, that extent. That they, you need to have potentially more freedom in those areas in order that um, ideas, even offensive ones, could be discussed. Concordance or thunder? I, I just want to add a, a quick point on this one, and that's that my, my sort of dedication to this is, uh, yeah, I said earlier it is essentially dogmatic, that's not entirely true. Um, it, it's basically um, set around this assumption that good ideas uh, propagate better than bad ones. And therefore, if you're actually interested in the growth of knowledge, then uh, the, the best filtering process, if you like, is to have um, as much permitted speech as possible. And that's essentially the sole pragmatic reason why I'm so pro-free speech. You know, if... if if the ideas are bad, then they can get shot down as being bad. Right? But if you actually start um, limiting what people can say, then um, you will never know. Or you may never know. Concordance. I think my primary motivation towards free speech, and I don't consider it one of my key issues. I, it's, it's important to everyone. Everyone should have a vested interest in 
again, I think it's it's the underlying foundational freedom that all the others are derived from, and that's our ability to do and say uh, what what we think, whether other people like it or not, uh, up to the point where you know it it actually causes the reverse effect. I think it, it's fundamental. But um, I had an American history professor who uh, was a dirty hippie who had gone through the 1960s uh, and gone through all the protests and was a big proponent of burning the flag. And I came into high school as a you know very conservative young Republican type, and he totally changed my perspective. And you know. When you make that journey, when you transition from one side to the other, it really does require that you re-examine both sides of the argument. So I, th I think it's very important. Okay, we're going to uh, try and see whether our next caller is with us. He's just messaged me saying he's not sure his microphone is working. Um, so uh, the caller, who I will now remove, um, has posted his question, and I will read it for you. I was wondering what your views on the uh, on anti-harassment policies when they are worded along the lines of quote unquote report when you think uh, you see harassment. It seems that most human courting rituals cannot work that way. External people cannot make that judgment. It seems. Yeah, it seems to me, and I think this is a point that actually Thunder and I were discussing the other day. If if you are never allowed to sort of like push the boundaries to a degree, um, it makes courtship very difficult. And um, what are you going to do at that 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 moment, that frisson? Um, are you going to hold back from kissing the person and say, "Before I kiss you, uh, can I just take this uh, po uh, this this questionnaire, please?" If I continue and kiss you, will you consider this to be sexual harassment? Question two and so on. I mean, it, it does seem somewhat um, unrealistic. But anyway, Thunder, let's start with you on this one. Actually, I mean, that sounds pretty much um, a point that I would agree on. Um, but I think Michael was saying that there is um, some necessity, you have some sort of um, policy and presumably policing action here. Um, so maybe I'll leave it to him to actually set out what he think the bound, thinks the boundary should be. Well, that's a bit harsh. I, let, me, let me see if I can make the question a bit easier. I think that what you're saying is it's, it's one thing to have a mission statement, if you like. Um, a conference can say, oh. this conference does not support any form of harassment, whether sexual, physical, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, so DPR, let, let, let me... Let me Sorry, um, um, so I, I think uh, these are the two ends of the spectrum you can aim for on this. The one end says this policy is aspirational, not operational. The other one says that it's operational, not aspirational. In one, you are actually guaranteeing a safe environment, which means that you inherit full li legal liability for it. In the other one, it's an aspirational policy, which is something that you hope to have in force. And there's this sort of gray area in between, which is mo where most of the policies um, seem to try and word it. In fact, most of the policies seem to be, as you would expect, defending the legal liability of the conference rather than uh, um, the interaction of the patrons with each other. Um, but they usually use language along the lines of we hope we or we, tr we are dedicated to um, a, uh, providing a safe environment. It doesn't say that we're going to provide a safe environment. Um, but, but so it's somewhere between operational and aspirational. Anyway, I'll, I'll, over to you, um, Mike. Uh, sure. Um, I think a lot of this could actually be uh, taken care of if there was a, much more of an emphasis put on education, um, both for event organizers and for other people too. Um, there's actually a program, um, when you brought up this example, DPR, of um, asking for consent uh, before each subsequent action. You know, that might actually not be the worst idea, or we could come a lot closer to that and still be pretty good. Um, there's a project, uh, I just had to look it up here quickly, called the Date Safe Project, and I've actually seen this presentation before. Um, that was given at uh, a university I was working with. And uh, they do a, an educational program called Can I Kiss You? And it's actually instituted in, in uh, high schools, in universities, and actually in the military, too. 
Um, I don't think it would be completely out of sorts for people to begin looking at these materials or even providing them at conferences because certainly every conference I've been to, like people interact socially or more uh, like or uh, like get into relationships and that sort of thing that that does happen and it, maybe it's okay for us we should be the organization or the, the movement that's actually comfortable with this that actually addresses it head-on and says uh, we don't have these beliefs that sex is always bad and that it's all that we should all be chased and, and go to our hotel rooms and, and um, put on our pajamas and go to sleep for six in the morning. It's we should be the ones that are actually taking the lead on this and actually providing materials. Like this is a, like this is a, a, an aspect. This is a, a way for us to actually lead the way. Um, like especially when the the same group. I'd really promote this this one in particular called the Date Safe Project, um, and they take on some pretty hard situations. It's the, the exact same situation we're experiencing that happens in college dorms or in military facilities as well. Like, we're not doing anything, we're not trekking area that hasn't been um, approached before. I think it's really important for us to realize uh, that there, these materials exist. Um, Michael. And actually, yeah. Michael, yeah. you do realize that the situations that you're describing is more when people are on the learning curve. People don't usually go to conferences to get educated about uh, sexuality. So they go to the conferences. Well, why are you trying to piggyback this on the atheist movement? Because we uh, can actually do something positive. There are lots of positive things that we could do. We could give them driving lessons when we get there. But why, why but, single out sexism like this? Well, because if everyone, if atheists were smashing into each other in the parking lot repeatedly and we were receiving reports that you know 10 people were run over every single time we have a conference yes, and yes and if we got reports that women were being you you are of course familiar with tail hook i have no idea what that is uh, this is more of an american thing thunder uh, yeah um give us um so tail hook now, if, if, if the atheist conferences were like Tailhook, then you would have a point, right? But they're not. These are things where basically adults come, turn up, um, they have some social interactions in the bars. I don't see why it's the conference's duty to police this or to try and educate people. I think that the atheist movement should actually try and focus its resources on atheism rather than actually sort of trying to split out in... Um, educate people on all sorts of other things. Before we get into the specific tactics of how to do it, I, I think it's important we agree on what the goal is, because everything else is a matter of how do we get there. The goal, as I see it, is to be inclusive and provide a safe environment for everyone um, so that they can have fun without worrying about it. I mean, the policy can protect everyone, uh, man, woman, whatever, in, in such a way that, you know, I feel confident if I talk to a woman that that's not going to be interpreted incorrectly or that these guidelines advance on what a proper product is. That goal has to be to address a real problem, I think, in the, the secular movement or the AC or the free thought, skeptic, whatever movement, and that is that it's a little stilted towards one gender. Um, and I think that it, it's in everyone's best interest to create an inclusive and safe environment. How we get there, I think, is open to interpretation and debate and discussion. And I think that's where the discussion derailed, is some people have a very specific idea of how it needs to be handled. And Thunder, I think you were, were critical of that approach but I hope, Thunder, maybe you could, you could uh, confirm this, that you agree that it's a good thing that we have a, a safe and inclusive environment for men and women. Um, I would actually take a um, more nuanced view, which is that <laughs> it is, it is it, now it, it, it's a social equilibrium, right? These things are all social equilibrium or you know, Nash equilibrium. 
right? There was there were, and there are two competing factors here. And you know, uh, the the analogy that I was suggesting earlier is um, the roads, right? Forty thousand people a year die on the roads. Now a lot of that's an acceptable compromise for society between the number of people who die and the number of people who use the roads. So. You, you could agitate that we should actually give people driving lessons at the atheist conferences because those 40,000 people are valuable people and you, you, you're just demeaning their experience because you've not experienced what it's like to lose someone on the roads. Now, the, the, there is an, an array of um, uh, reasons why people die on the roads um, just like there's a reason, uh, an array of reasons why women might feel intimidated in bars. Um, some of it is just unwanted attention. Some of it is just people being socially awkward. Some of it is people being predatorial. Um, and I would actually suggest that uh, the only one that is, the, the problem with all of these is um, that there are two things that can go on in bars. There is um, how shall we say normal types of social interaction which you don't have any problem with and then there is what you would call harassment which can actually entail exactly the same acts the only difference is how they are received right? or context so this make, yeah, the exactly. context also matters right? and that's which, which, which makes these things really very difficult to police. Yes. I mean, if you if you were to like the the analogy on the roads is drunk driving is very easy to police because it's a very easy metric to measure, but three quarters of the accidents that happen on the roads don't involve drunk driving. Yeah, you know, they're just people not paying attention, people acting like jerks. These are much harder to quantify. Now, uh, what, uh, yeah, if I were to take the analogy here, we need better row. Uh, we need better rules to stop people from being jerks on the road to save the forty thousand people who die on the roads. Is the equivalent of saying we need more harassment policies at the conference um, to reduce the amount of sexual harassment? There is a social equilibrium here. Isn't that and, where your analogy fails, though, Thunder? Because taking practical steps to um, stop careless driving is not quite the same as simply having a mission statement at a conference. But in that there are thousands of traffic laws, Thunder, that, that generally are there to protect people from right. hurting each other. I mean, that, that's something we accept, that when we drive down the road, there are certain rules of the road that you need to follow, and it's not right. curtailing your, your ability to get to where you're going. It just says, you know, here are the safe ways right. to do this, and, you know, even so, maybe but, there are some consequences. But there is an equilibrium. And yes, I mean, uh, to, to an extent, we have already rules at the conference of some description. The question is, do you want more rules or less rules? Or is the status quo actually acceptable and fit for purpose? But do you agree with me that the goal is an inclusive and safe environment for everybody? I mean, can we, we agree on that, that point, that there, there's value in making people feel comfortable um, so that they can have a good time, right? It's possible well, maybe to it, have it, if, if you're saying it's a state point, is it good to have that? Yes, in the same way that it's good to have people being able to drive on the roads without fear of being killed in a car accident. Right, at right, and we point, can disagree about that. At that point, that. I'm going to insist that we move on because we've got one, and unfortunately it's going to be the last caller. Uh, and can I just say... I think it's an interesting conversation. I think it's one that should be addressed seriously. And that is why I kicked the person who was commenting on Blog TV that Rebecca Watson was too ugly to rape and he wouldn't rape her. Sorry, that's not constructive. It's, um, it's, it's shabby. But anyway, let's move on. CK, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here, guys. Hi. Hi, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. We've that's got okay. 10 minutes. Um, please go ahead. What have you got for us? Yeah, so I think my question is probably not really connected to anything that you've discussed today but that's all right uh, we probably need a break <laughs> okay. well it's a, it's a logical inconsistency that i think i've identified with certain definitions of god um i was watching an interview with uh, you, I, I have to say that i've never heard a logically consistent statement about god but hey go on well um i was watching an interview with francis collins uh and the the topic of evolution came up and he basically expressed that he was perfectly 
he, he perfectly understood that evolution was a completely natural process. There was no uh, divine intervention at, at any part of this process that resulted in us. And the way that he reconciled that was at the moment that God created the universe, he had infinite knowledge that so he was able to foresee the outcome at the moment of his creation. So the question that that, that, that made me want to ask is if God is all powerful, uh, sorry, not all powerful, all knowing, then his requirement to ever intervene disappears surely at the moment that he creates the universe. It, it directly clashes with it with the with the concept of an intervening god. Um, but he he gifted us free will, did he not? Well, and does if, that mean that? Uh, are you saying that even though he gave us free will, he would know how we would exercise that free will? Yeah, Michael. Um, yeah, I'm not really saying uh, where where exactly is the. Uh, the inconsistency. There's a lot of loopholes that they use. I'm just trying to sort them out in my head. Okay, so if God, let's say the Big Bang was the beginning of the universe for the sake of this discussion, mm -hmm. he, he creates the universe, and he creates the universe knowing the exact series of events that will follow. Okay. So it, in essence, he knows exactly what will happen until the eventual destruction of the universe, however, however that will take place. Now, any, any intervention after his initial creation would, would sort of imply that he didn't have the foresight after all to know exactly what would happen and his intervention was therefore required. So the concept of an intervening God, to, it seems to me, is... Oh yeah, right. that's, certainly, that's certainly contradictory. Um, I think Determinism comes, problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it, yeah. The, I think it actually comes to, um, and this is something that I should really just write down somewhere or make a video on it, um, is that there's very contradictory histories and ideas of what God is, and that like contemporary Christian, uh, like standard cafeteria Christian uh, view of God is just a complete chimera of Greek, Zoroastrian, uh, and Hebrew ideas. So it, yeah, it, it's not, um, I'd say, something that you wouldn't get a lot of resistance on because they might say that, oh, they know the ultimate goal, but maybe not how it's achieved or something like that. But fundamentally, when you're talking about full knowledge of everything that's going to happen and this idea of the, the designer of the universe having control over literally everything, then, yeah, that does contradict with the idea, with many ideas of God even those explicitly made in the Bible, such as he makes mistakes, he doesn't know the future, he makes bets with Satan, that sort of thing. I, th I think what I like about this, though, is that it doesn't require any interpretation of Scripture to, for them to sort I of... Think you'd only, I think it would be another set of errors to have in your quill if you could actually bring out the examples of Scripture that absolutely um, contradict the idea of an all-knowing God. Like, if you're actually going out and doing and speaking to Christians about this um, and mm. getting some feedback from it, you'd, you'd really only be served by um, having uh, a lot of the Old Testament. Um, it, God is basically a, a guy walking around that does stuff, um, makes mistakes, reconsiders things. Um, even right in Genesis, uh, it starts with... Um, God creating man and man essentially saying, like, this creation is really boring. Can you fix it? And God's yeah. like, oh, sh yeah. Like, so it's, um, <clears throat> uh, and the tree in the, the garden wasn't such a great idea either. So it, like, you don't, there's countless examples, especially in the Old Testament, that, you'd, that you should really look into um, and take the idea really seriously uh, that if, um, if he is all-powerful or all-knowing, um, then this sort of behavior, the documented behavior of God, uh, is completely inconsistent. Before I go to concordance, uh, CK, thank you very much. I'm going to remove you whilst um, uh, concordance responds because I want to wrap this up on um, half past the hour. But thank you very much indeed for the call. Concordance. Uh, okay. I'll keep it kind of brief. I, I actually had breakfast with Francis Collins one time uh, about three years ago. Uh, he was at a, a sci small scientific conference uh, that I was at, and 
Um, just happened to be a seat at the table. I, I didn't engage with them too much, but I wish I had a video camera. Because religion actually came up, someone else asked the question, you know, I know you're an uh, evangelical Christian, and you know, how do you re reconcile that? And he was very frank about it. He's a really nice guy, very instantly likable. Um, but one of the things that he said is that he's okay with not knowing. You know, he's okay with conflicts. It's, it's less important to him to get the details right than to get the general gist. To, you know, his faith is more important than his apologetics. Um, and, he, you know, he, he had an analogy, and I can't remember exactly what it was, about, um, you know, when, when something is revealed to you, it doesn't matter how it works. You just you can appreciate it on that basis. It was a, it was a, it was a good argument. He's a, a pretty eloquent guy. I'm not sure uh, it is a, a good argument. I mean, I, I um, often have used the clip of Richard Feynman saying that he can live with doubt and uncertainty right. and not having an answer is better having, uh, than having an answer that is, is wrong. Um, I, I don't see how that quite relates to Collins's position, but that, I'm afraid, is going to have to wait for a future no. show. I'm All sorry, right. we've got two minutes in which to wrap up and I've got a couple of things that I would like to say. Firstly, um, if you haven't already, please um, vote in the poll on Blog TV as to how you want uh, this uh, being posted on to YouTube. And it looks very much as if you want it in one segment. Great for me. Saves me a lot of work. Uh, I think the compromise is to have it all in one segment and have uh, in the description um, sort of like labels as to which point in the course of the program certain people um, called in or certain topics were discussed. So I think that that's the way we'll go. Uh, again, just to remind you that we will be posting this on iTunes once we've figured out how iTunes works. Uh, secondly, I have to give a shout out for the Médecins Sans Frontières Doctors Without Borders charity event, which will be taking place over the weekend of the 8th and 9th of September of this year. Um, not going to tell you who's going to be on, but all I will say is that the the changes, it's going to be... Uh, fresher, more entertaining, uh, more fun. And you can find out as things uh, happen by visiting the uh, Magic Sandwich Show website. And if you don't know where that is, it's very easy www.com Magic Sandwich Show. Sorry, www.magicsandwichshow.com. My apologies. Also, made it much easier for you. If you go above the uh, video box into the banner of, on the Blog TV show, you will see links uh, to Facebook. Uh, YouTube and our website. They'll, you'll also see that there's now a big button there saying just giving. The donation pages for this year's event are already open, so uh, please consider uh, donating. Can I thank Cream enormously for standing in for Tony? Yes, we had some certain technical different difficulties. It was the first time he's done it, and I know from exchanges that I've been having with him during the course of the show, he's, he's sweating away. Uh, doing his absolute best. So thank you very much indeed, Cream, for your assistance. And uh, please, a thumbs up uh, for him. It's the first time he's done it, so it's not surprising that things um, weren't, didn't work perfectly. But uh, this show, as I say, will be posted on YouTube and also um, subsequently uh, on iTunes. Last words, anyone? Okay, no last words. It's the first time. Uh, Forgot to mention, thank you to Theoretical Bullshit, who was with us in the first half of the show, and we will be taking up uh, him up on his offer to appear on future shows. shows. But thank you again. Um, Theoretical Bullshit, Thunderfoot, Concordance, Michael Payton, and Cream, working away in the background. Thank you very much indeed. We'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. Oh, I should make last one last word. Two weeks' time, we've got Non-Stamp Collector as, as a panellist on the show, and in four weeks' time, we have the uh, Indian head of, um, oh, damn it, I knew I'd forget the name, humanitarian organization in India who is facing prosecution for blasphemy for pointing out that sewage water uh, coming out of the toes of uh, a statue of Jesus was indeed sewage water and not miracle water. On that bombshell, we will see you in two weeks' time. Take care.